Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some new discoveries coming from our neighbor Mars. Some from within Mars itself, and some from the surface of Mars billions of years ago. With at least some of these discoveries actually being very surprising. Redefining our understanding of what Mars is as a planet. Or redefining our understanding of internal activity of Mars itself. And let's actually start with this particular story, because it's probably the biggest discovery of them all. It looks like Mars might be geologically alive after all, not a dead planet that scientists envisioned it for decades and decades. It seems to contain quite a lot of signs that there is a lot of internal activity, with some of this activity even leading to volcanoes in relatively recent geological times. Which is something that the scientists really didn't expect. Because Mars is much smaller than planet Earth and planet Venus, it's always been believed that over time it just became kind of solidified with its internal structure, instead of producing some kind of a dynamo, eventually becoming solid and still. In other words, that the internal activity of Mars very likely ceased to exist billions of years ago. Whereas on both Earth and Venus, because the size and mass is much bigger, both planets are still relatively hot inside, and both contain active mantle that pushes things around, moves things around as well, and eventually produces activity on the surface, which, at least on Earth, results in both plate tectonics and, of course, volcanism from a lot of massive plumes. Mantle plumes that move around, pushing surface up, and sometimes escaping to the surface through volcanic eruptions. And I think here, a lava lamp analogy might make the most sense. On both Earth and Venus, we have a lot of this going on inside the planets. Whereas on Mars, it was believed that this stopped a long time ago. But when it did exist, it was very active. So active, as a matter of fact, that it produced the biggest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, along with several other really large volcanoes visible from really far away. For example, the biggest region is known as the Tharsis region, that as you can see has quite a lot of volcanoes, all pretty much in the same location. This was very likely produced by some kind of a humongous plume. But there's also a smaller region known as the Elysium region, that obviously has a few volcanoes as well. But all of these were created over 3 billion years ago, and so it was always believed that this was basically the end of Martian geological activity. However, something unexpected started happening when NASA landed the InSight probe. The probe that's about to end its mission because its solar panels are no longer operational. But in the last few years, surprisingly, it was actually detecting a huge amount of earthquakes. Some being relatively strong as well. And this is not something scientists expected at all. And a lot of these earthquakes were actually originating from a relatively similar area. And interestingly, when the scientists were originally planning this mission, they actually specifically chose a location that they thought is going to be relatively quiet. There are not going to be a lot of disturbances, there are not going to be a lot of smaller earthquakes, mostly because it was believed to be flat and quiet. You can sort of see the location right here on this map. And the reason they wanted this location to be quiet is of course because they were going to be using very sensitive instruments to listen to a lot of vibrations coming through the planet. Essentially studying its geology through minute earthquakes detected by very sensitive instruments. And originally this already gave the scientists a bit of a hint that something else was going on here. In this case, something inside the planet itself. But in the last few years, the scientists started to discover some really unusual hints in this region known as Elysium Planitia. With first hints being volcanism at least 200 million years ago, but more importantly, small explosions of volcanic ash that might have happened 53,000 years ago. With the actual ash deposits being really young and up until now being somewhat controversial. But a lot of these signs were definitively confirmed by various scientists in the region known as Cerberus Fossa. An unusual set of young fissures or young cracks that actually stretch for more than 800 miles or nearly 1200 kilometers across the entire surface of Mars. So maybe not the same type of volcanism as on planet Earth, but definitely something really unusual and definitely something implying that Mars might still be active. But all of these were hints detected before, years ago. Something else, a lot more definitive, was identified very recently. Something that suggests that Mars is indeed active and these fissures are just one of the signs. With a lot of this analysis focusing on the surface itself and the inclination or the location of various features compared to some of the other features such as craters. For example, many of these fractures cut through various hills and various craters that are relatively young as well. Here we're talking about something that was created in the last billion years, which obviously suggests that these happened way after. On top of this, and this is really important, an entire region was uplifted by at least one kilometer or sometimes even two kilometers making this one of the highest regions in the northern lowlands. It's obviously not the only region uplifted in such a way, but in this case, there is something else that makes it a little bit unusual. 
the surface of the entire area is actually tilted just a little bit away from a certain imaginary center, as if something from beneath the surface pushed onto the crust and lifted this entire area. And that's kind of what usually plumes do. A massive plume, such as the one in, for example, Hawaii, will usually uplift the surface, but will also then start producing volcanism, which basically is how Hawaii was created as well. Another really common example is, of course, Iceland. And if they are correct in their assumption, this implies that this is a giant plume. It's very likely 3 to 4,000 kilometers wide, and is probably the reason why we have all these unusual features that could not be explained otherwise. It explains the Cerberus fossa that go for over a thousand kilometers. It also explains recent observations of volcanism as far back as 53,000 years ago. But more importantly, it also explains why InSight has been detecting so many unusual earthquakes, and some actually relatively powerful ones, coming from this region that was expected to be really quiet with nothing going on. And from what we know about planet Earth, we usually expect two types of geological activities to be able to create so many excessive earthquakes either plate tectonics or really large plumes underneath the crust itself. And since the surface observation is determined there is definitely no plate tectonics anywhere, massive powerful plumes is the only other potential explanation. But because this is still going on and because this is definitely not finished yet, it also implies that volcanoes can one day become active again and potentially even produce enough emissions or even enough heat on the planet to maybe even melt some of the ice caps or maybe even create liquid water at least for a little bit. But more importantly, in this case, in our search for extraterrestrial life, these types of volcanic regions are usually known to host a lot of exotic life. As a matter of fact, all of these emissions and all of the energy produced is basically heaven for a lot of different bacteria. And so officially, this is now the best region for us to potentially find some kind of extraterrestrial life somewhere on Mars, which makes this a really exciting region to land in for any future mission. But that's one of the first discoveries. The other discovery is, I guess, from a little bit way back, when Mars looked very different and possessed a huge ocean and possibly habitable conditions on the surface. And in this case, the scientists have identified a cometary impact from approximately 3.4 billion years ago, responsible for one of the biggest tsunamis on Mars, or possibly even some of the biggest in the solar system, but also somewhat equivalent to the one that was responsible for the demise of dinosaurs here on Earth 65 million years ago. But it's obviously not the first time we talk about these tsunamis on Mars, and actually one of the older videos from a few years ago discusses some of the first discoveries by NASA and by a lot of different studies. Here the scientists were able to identify at least two cases of major tsunami events, very likely happening just a few million years apart, but both having slightly different effects. The younger tsunami might have occurred when the oceans were already much smaller. And the analysis was actually able to definitively show that there was quite a lot of deposit from what seemed to be a tsunami, and in this case a tsunami that was really large. And though the evidence for the tsunami was clear, it wasn't clear what created it. The crater was not found just yet. There were some speculations about craters that could have created this, but it wasn't certain. But the new analysis goes in a little bit more detail, even recreating the potential tsunami wave, while even discovering certain fallout effects as well as other deposits, confirming that this is exactly what probably happened. And intriguingly enough, the Viking 1 lander basically landed on top of some of these older deposits. Now prior to this, this crater didn't really have a name, but they now named it Pole, and it has a diameter of approximately 110 kilometers, and is located in the northern lowlands as well. The region that was very likely covered by the oceans, with a potential depth of about 120 meters. And the asteroid that collided with Mars was either 3 kilometers in size, as the smallest estimate, up to possibly 9 kilometers in size, as the largest estimate. It really depends on how deep the oceans were, and also on the amount of ground resistance when the asteroid hit Mars. But it resulted in a mega tsunami, very likely 200 to 300 meters tall, moving approximately 1500 kilometers away from the center of the explosion, and creating all of these distant deposits visible today which is actually surprisingly similar to what happened on Earth 65 million years ago. The dinosaur killer asteroid very likely produced extremely similar effects. And so what makes the study intriguing is of course the discovery of the official crater, responsible for at least one of these mega tsunamis, and the naming of the crater as well, as well as the simulation and the explanation for everything observed. But we also had some other discoveries in regards to water on Mars, with many of these discoveries suggesting that Mars back then was extremely Earth-like more Earth-like than we even think. But for example, one recent study identifying 
several new lakes and lake deposits that existed here for millions of years. Although in some cases some of these lakes actually were a chain of lakes, basically all connected to one another, so possibly a little bit different from what we have on Earth, but still producing very similar effects. And so all of these potentially habitable conditions, along with recent discoveries of still active volcanism, still really make Mars the most likely place to potentially find extraterrestrial life. And if we don't find it here, or on other objects such as Titan and Saudas in Europa, that's of course when we have to start asking questions. Can life actually exist anywhere else? And so in the next decade or so, or possibly a few decades, we might finally have some of these answers. For now we get a lot of clues, a lot of hints, with more evidence suggesting that Mars is basically a tiny sibling of our planet, but still nothing definitive just yet. Which means that I'll be making more videos trying to figure out the truth and trying to find out what's happening here. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.